uh, in the last uh, a few weeks we had Emmanuel and uh, Vijay and Suril talk to us about uh, the grace of God and the flaws of men. And we saw how uh, flawed men like, uh, um, like uh, Jacob, you know, who was a cheat, but then uh, God made him father of, um, uh, he made him into a nation. And we saw Judah, who also, uh, it was not his righteousness that uh, God chose him to be uh, in the line for uh, Jesus. So we see that how uh, God took flawed men. Can you raise your Okay, we see how uh, God took uh, flawed men and then um, by His grace, you know, He, he um, used them. And uh, so uh, that's what we saw. Uh, so um, uh, this time we are going to look at a completely uh, different picture. We are going to look at the book, book of Job, and there we don't see uh, a flawed person, but we see Job, who God said was blameless and upright. So we see that when we start reading the book of Job, from the very first verse onwards, he, he said that Job was blameless and upright. And we see here that. Uh, this uh, job who was blameless and upright, we see that he suffered. So the, uh, most of the book uh, goes through uh, explaining his suffering and he is trying to find a reason for his suffering. So from this book of Job, we are going to uh, look at uh, what is our motive for serving God uh, by looking at the book of Job. And this uh, book is uh, classified under one of the wisdom books. If you look at the books in the Bible, it's classified under wisdom literature and uh, so we'll uh, see what does this wisdom book of Job tell us and uh, how does it, uh, what does it talk about our motive for serving God. So before we look at this wisdom, let's uh, bow down our heads and pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your God who speaks to us and today as we look into the book of Job. Lord, uh, we pray that you would help us to set aside our human understanding, Lord, and uh, help us to discern from your speech to Job. And Lord, we pray that, uh, uh, Lord, we pray that we will continue to grow in your understanding, Lord, and we continue to act in your wisdom, Lord. And in everything we do, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Alright, so we'll see, uh, we'll look at the Old uh, Testament wisdom and we'll see what it, uh, uh, how it operates. If we look at the Old Testament wisdom, there's a divine rule which is held to be constant and intelligent. We know that uh, uh, we believe in uh, one God, the Israelites believed in one God, uh, Yahweh, and the divine rule was held to be constant and intelligent, so that it was an intelligent and it was unchanging. So unlike uh, those uh, Mesopotamia and uh, Egyptians who were there at that time, and they believed in many gods, and they were uh, polytheistic. Israel believed in a mon monotheistic uh, religion, and they had uh, Yehovah or Jehovah as their god. And the divine code was that God rewards those who obey and punishes those who disobey. So this was the uh, common understanding and this was the divine code. And we had what's called the retribution principle which uh, states that if you are righteous then you will prosper and if not righteous then you don't prosper. So this was the understanding at that time and this was also written into the mosaic uh, uh, covenant, the corporate covenant, the Mosaic law, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, it has this, like if you do a certain, uh, behave in a certain way and if you do these things, then you will be blessed and if you behave uh, the opposite way, then you will be cursed. So these were there in the, in the Mosaic covenant uh, and uh, um, the retribution principle, uh, when it says that if you are righteous then you prosper, it doesn't mean if you take a contraposition, it doesn't mean that 
if you are not prospering, that means if you are not righteous, that you are with sin. And similarly, the converse of if not righteous, then not prosper, does not mean that if you prosper, uh, or uh, the, the converse of this does not become true. And this is uh, um, one thing that people took this retribution principle and they had this, they had this idea that if somebody is uh, prospering, then he is certainly blessed, and if somebody is not prospering, then he is certainly uh, he is with sin. And this was the outcome. And uh, the book of when uh, the book of Job was uh, written, this was the same idea that uh, people had. So if you look at Old Testament wisdom, um, it has two. Uh, it can be classified into two types. One is practical wisdom, and one is reflective wisdom. And uh, if you look at practical wisdom, it is the wisdom that comes from uh, experience and from observation. And uh, one of the examples of the books with uh, practical wisdom is the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, we see there are uh, many sayings, like a father giving an instruction to a son, saying that this is the way you live, and this, is, this will be the outcome, and if, if this is the way you live, and it will be uh, such an such an, such outcome. And there are also wise sayings, where uh, uh, people, there are wise people who are uh, saying different things, and these are recorded. And if you look at the uh, uh, book of Proverbs, uh, you'll also find what is called Lady Wisdom. There's a character called uh, Lady Wisdom. It always uh, personifies wisdom as a woman. And the reason is, uh, it, in, in, in Hebrew, is wisdom has a feminine gender. Now in English, we don't have a gender for wisdom. But uh, in Hebrew, uh, Chokmah, which stands for wisdom, is, uh, has a feminine gender. And so, the, when the Israelite scribes wrote this, uh, the book of Proverbs, they uh, personified Lady Wisdom, and then to go against Lady Wisdom, there is also Madam Folly. So there are two ladies who are there's Lady Wisdom who proclaims, for those who come to me, you know, I will show you the right path. And then there is Madam Folly ready to foil the plans of the Lord God, and uh, was always there to send people along a different path. So you see, there are two paths, and uh, the Book of Proverbs tells them, tells us, or reminds us to walk on one particular path. Uh, which is righteous, and if you go on the other path, then you would be, uh, that, that's a path that's leading to death. Uh, and if you look at uh, the Proverbs, these are not sayings which uh, originated from Israelite people. These were there at the time. The, um, uh, the sages at that time, uh, they had these sayings, so this, this was something which people had. The wisdom did not just uh, arise among the Israelite people. Wisdom was there in the beginning when uh, God created uh, you know, um, different things during his creation, he created things in his wisdom, in God's wisdom. So wisdom was there from the beginning, and uh, all the sages had this wisdom. And by just by uh, observation, people took these, uh, and uh, when the Israelite scribes found these, and they aligned, they took the sayings which aligned with the uh, word of God or with the will of God, and then they um, uh, actually collated that into what is called the Book of Proverbs. And that's what we have here. That's practical wisdom. And it is a wisdom for skillful living, which we can uh, use um, as, we, as, as and when we need it. Uh, and uh, then you have what is called reflective wisdom. And this, uh, the book of Job is an example of that. And here you have, uh, there's a narrative, there's a story, and uh, it actually, if you read through that, and if you go through the book of Job and look through his suffering, then it helps us to understand and reflect and find out why certain things are happening. Sometimes you don't even get an answer. For example, in the book of Job, why do people suffer? And you read the whole book and God tells them what He wants to, uh, His uh, people to know, but he, he doesn't give an answer for why suffering happens. So this is reflective wisdom. So we are going to look at the book of Job, which is a book on reflective wisdom. So we'll see, uh, look at the story of Job and uh, quickly have uh, just kind of concised it. And uh, Job, he lived in the land of Uz. And uh, the very first uh, verse in the first chapter says, he was blameless and upright. And he feared God and he shunned evil. And it also says that he was very rich. So there's a description of how 
um, you know, the, the number of sheep he had, and the number of donkeys, the cattle, and the camels he had. So this was uh, during his time. This was how uh, the wealth was uh, measured: the number of donkeys, the number of camels, and uh, the number of cattle that you had. And also, he had family, and he had uh, sons and daughters, and he, so he had a good family. So, if you look at um, the uh, viewpoint of anybody who was looking at the life of Job at that time, he was affluent and which means he was blessed by God and if he was blessed by God which meant that he was righteous you know. so that was the outlook that uh, people had so, and, and he was uh, blameless and upright not only in the eyes of men but also in the eyes of God because we read as we come down um, when uh, Satan after roaming around the world and uh, you know what, what Satan does is he roams around the world and tries to uh, create trouble. You know, that is his, uh, I mean, that is his hobby. So he goes around doing this, and then he comes to the presence of God, and he uh, and God uh, senses, you know, what Satan is trying to do, and he says, "Have you looked, seen my servant Job? And he is blameless and upright. He fears God, and he shuns evil." And uh, so God brings this up, and Satan says, "Satan replied." Does Job fear God for nothing? So Satan is saying that you have put a hedge around uh, Job and his family and you are protecting him and you have prospered him and the only reason he is uh, worshipping you or that he, he is not cursing you that he is uh, praising you and he is standing along with you the only reason he, does, he is doing that because he is prosperous so now he is looking at the retribution principle and he's taking it and looking at the uh, in uh, the converse of it where he's saying that the only reason job is righteous is because of the goodness with which you have treated him and god um, allows satan so satan says let me try to harm his family and then let's let, let us see how what he does he's certainly going to curse god and god allows him God allows Satan to destroy everything Job had, but not touch him. Which means, we'll see in the coming verses that uh, his sheep, his oxen, his camels, they all died. Not only that, all his children died and uh, Job was left with uh, no family and all his wealth gone. And in all this, even after losing his wealth and his children, Job did not accuse God of any wrongdoing but he praised him. So he stood in the midst of this uh, suffering of losing everything that he had and uh, still he did not curse God as Satan um, wished that he would do. Now, uh, next uh, chapter we see that Job is afflicted again and this time uh, Satan again meets God and then uh, he tells God that Certainly, if you touch his life, if you take away a man's life, then he is going to curse, uh, curse God. So, um, what uh, God did, God allowed Satan, he gave him permission to strike Job, his, his flesh and bones, and he said, I cannot, uh, I cannot give you his life, but you can attack his body, and you can attack his flesh and uh, bones. And uh, what happened is, painful sores broke out on his body. So Satan always brings misery. We can see that it's not God who brings misery, but it is Satan who is bringing all this misery. So he, he uh, was afflicted with painful sores which broke out on his body and even his wife asked him to curse God and die. So when he was in this hopeless state, um, his, uh, even his wife said, why are you holding on to this God? But uh, Job treasured his relationship with God and he held on to God and uh, his wife said why don't you curse him and uh, die and what we see here is God did not give Satan a clamp upon Job's will and this is what uh, God does we may have suffering we may, uh, we may have prosperity we may have suffering but our free will is something which God doesn't uh, take away because uh, and we, can, we see that he did not give a Satan a clamp upon Job's will. And this is uh, true with us also because we, when we heard the gospel, we have the free will. God has given us a choice to accept him. He does not, uh, he does not condemn anyone or he doesn't uh, 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 
I'm not going to go into something like predestination and all that, but it doesn't mean that you know it is certain people are you know God is God in His foreknowledge knows who is going to come to Him. That is what it means. But the thing is, everyone has a free will, and what Christ did is He died for all of mankind, and whoever <coughs> accepts Jesus as His Lord and Savior can um, he gets He has life. And uh, so God does not give set a clamp upon John's will. And sometimes we can ask this question: Why is this? Why are there wars? Why are there catastrophes? You know, it's because people uh, there are forces of evil who uh, make people do these things. Um, and Satan's job is to the thief comes to kill, uh, steal, kill, and destroy, and that's what he does. And uh, so we may say, why doesn't God God control this? Why can't uh, God is omnipotent? Why can't He just control wars and uh, catastrophes? And if we if He does that, then uh, He will be like a whimsical despot who is toying with His creation. So He is like He'll be like a uh, like a dictator, you know, who is doing things. And uh, what happens is we would it would reduce man to the status of a puppet. So whatever God wants, if He is making man do. So what God does is He has given us free will and you can see in the case of Job also He had given this free will. And what did Job choose to do? He still did not sin against God. He did not sin against God and uh, his three friends came to see him and uh, they sat with him for a whole week, for seven days uh, the Bible says and without saying anything. So they were um, um, quiet. Imagine, you know, his friends coming to him and uh, they know that he is blameless and upright and now they have nothing to say. Now, how could they account for uh, his suffering, you know, his intense suffering, which they, uh, in their knowledge, it can happen only because of sin and uh, this blameless and upright. So they were sitting there mulling over what to say to Job and then after one week, one of the uh, three friends spoke, uh, spoke and you have all the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, they took turns and they again used this traditional wisdom which they had from the retribution principle and they uh, started telling him that the righteous is never going to suffer and the unrighteous always does. And they, if you look at uh, Job uh, chapter 4 verse 7, it says, when has the innocent ever perished? So they are questioning that and they are uh, insisting and they, they started off slowly and then they bring the discourse. They keep on harping on this same thing over and over again and you see there are conversation which goes from Eliphaz, Job replies, then uh, Bildar and Job replies and so far Job replies. Again it goes on and again a third time and uh, by this time Job is exhausted because of the eyes of God and um, he uh, refused claiming his innocence. So Job says, I am innocent, I am not uh, sin. He examines himself and uh, as God claims, he is blameless and upright. So he doesn't uh, feel that his suffering is justified. So what he is trying to do next, as we see through the, through the discourses, is that um, uh, Job tries to plead his case. He says to, the, uh, uh, says to Yahweh, I have prepared a case and if you just come and uh, I long to see you and if I see you then uh, I can plead my case and I can prove my innocence. So he is looking for vindication of something, saying uh, of uh, things which he has not done and he wants to uh, prove that uh, this suffering is unjustified. And also with overtones of self-righteousness, he uh, lists out several things that he has done and how he is right in everything that he has done. And you can see um, different verses which uh, actually talks about how he says that I am righteous because I have done this, this, this. And as he is uh, going through his discourses, we don't just see his um, uh, agony and his suffering and then his uh, reasoning as to why this unjust suffering. But at the same time, he also longs for Yahweh's presence which he enjoyed in the past. So we can see that he is uh, actually uh, longing for the Yahweh who had preserved him all along, all this time. And then uh, Yahweh who had shown his light in his path so that he, could, he didn't have to walk in darkness. He recalls the fellowship he had with uh, God in the youth. And he also uh, recalls the divine assurance that he had 
with uh, God and the comfort of his family and children. He recalls his abundance and riches that he had and uh, that was a stamp of God's presence in his life. And not only in his house but also out in the streets and in the city, there too he had respect among the people. So uh, you see that Job is uh, longing for that presence, that uh, divine presence which he had, which, uh, uh, which he had all these years and which now uh, that God has withdrawn from him. People, these same people are mocking him. So the tables have turned and uh, he is longing for that presence. And what happens is Elihu, the young guy of his three older friends, there is a younger friend, Elihu, and he intervenes. Now he does not go and... Uh, so when these people have come to give job comfort in his time of suffering, uh, Elihu intervenes and he doesn't uh, talk about uh, Job's sin, but he says that you are unjust in, uh, I mean, do not uh, find uh, uh, fault with God, do not care, call him uncaring and do not call him unjust. He says God is, indeed is caring and uh, God is not unjust, he is a just God and he does not reward people based on what they do, but he rewards them on the basis of love and grace. And as we heard in our earlier uh, um, previous uh, sermons on uh, the grace of God, where uh, people who are unrighteous also receive grace, and in, and in plenty, we we'll see that Elihu also uh, consoles Job, saying that your rewards, uh, God is going to reward you on the basis of His love and grace. But still, there is no answer to his suffering and why he is suffering. And, and when all these discourses between people are over, then um, Job says, why, why do I even serve God? You know, he, he's, uh, he cries out to God and says, I need an answer. And then Yahweh answers Job out of a storm. And God answers Job out of a storm. And uh, in all the conversations that he had, he never addresses Job's suffering directly. There's not a hint of why Job is going through his suffering. So, if Job wanted to know why this suffering, God is not answering. God is not interested in answering why we suffer. Nor did he answer Job's attacks on his justice. Now, he was not uh, trying, he never tried to vindicate Job of what he has done. And he was not even, he didn't think that it was important for God to explain to man why these things happen. But God, what, he, what God does is He presents His creation in all its power and beauty and drawing Job to God's majesty. So uh, we see that uh, God talks about His creation, He talks about uh, the earth, He talks about the sea, He talks about the vast expanse, He talks about uh, darkness and light, He talks about the snow, hail, rain and how he forms the clouds and how it rains, he talks about constellations and he shows that all, in, all the majesty of his creation and he's asked Job, did you create all this? So he is, uh, all, he is uh, all, God, all God wanted Job to know that is that you look at me in all my majesty and then being surrounded by mysteries that Job cannot fathom, he is inadequate to question God. He is saying you are, your knowledge is so limited, you are so inconsequential. He's, he says you are a puny little guy compared to this greatness of my majesty. Uh, if you uh, look in Hindi, you know, we will uh, we'll say, uh, in Hindi movies they say, Teri aukar kya hai, you know. So it's like, you know, how, how dare you, you know, what is your, what audacity you have to stand in front of me. And I remember the song which we sang, uh, you know, where we say, uh, Asman se bhi uncha, and tere vicha, sagar ke, red se ja, uh, yeah, right. So more than the signs of the sea, that's how big your thoughts are. And God is saying, look at me in all my majesty, and you, who are uh, such a puny little guy, you are saying that you are teaching me and uh, you are giving me counsel about how I, I should be a just God. And not only that, God asks who made the animals and controls them. He, and he talks about um, you know, the feeding the animals and the birds, he talks about 
the birth of the young. Uh, he talks about the freedom of the wild donkeys and the, the defiance of the wild ox, the stupidity of the ostrich, and then he talks about the might of the war horse and the flight of the eagle and the hawk. So he lists all these out and he says, who created them and who controls them? He says, it is I who does it and not you. And on top of that, he talks about these big creatures and there's a half a chapter on Behemoth and there's a full chapter, chapter 41 on Leviathan and these are monsters and he says, can, uh, who tames these monsters? Can man tame, this, tame these monsters? And uh, so he tells Job that it is my mighty arm. So it says, it is God's mighty arm. It's my power and it is my wisdom you see in this creation and it is my, my power that you see that controls the world. And you ask me, whether, uh, you know, you, you little man have the audacity to ask me whether I am, uh, you know, am, am I just. So what we see here is, um, and even David, you know, for that instance, you know, we remember in the uh, Psalms, David said, uh, what is man that you are, uh, yeah, what is man that you are my, my, mindful of him? So you, uh, what is man that you are mindful of him? And man is so puny, David knows that, but also God cares for man and that is what David found. And here God is saying that it is not just puny to you, but also look at all these things that I have created, look at all the animals and the big creatures, you know, I control all of them, it is not, and I am a just God and I am just to my, all my creatures and not just, uh, so you cannot ask me about justice. So the essence of God's speech is that God called attention to his superior wisdom and his power which is manifested in his creation of which we have no understanding and uh, this is what God does, so God does not uh, and, this, and God's entire speech never talked about suffering, never talked about uh, any uh, explanation for uh, 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 Job's uh, plight and uh, whether he was just uh, in uh, treating Job a particular way but he says that he wants to draw attention to his uh, superior wisdom and power and uh, he also wants man to put his trust in, in this power and wisdom so it is in this mighty God whose power and wisdom we must put our trust in and uh, it's not, uh, it is okay when you are, when you have suffering and you can ask God why this suffering and God may choose to answer you but then you cannot question his justice based on some man-made or human principle which says that hey, I have been righteous so I do not deserve this suf uh, suffering and I deserve blessing instead of suffering and if you are suffering, again you cannot go, uh, go and ask God to justify why uh, you know, God has uh, stricken you with this suffering if God reveals, it is good, and but you cannot, um, all God says is, you need to trust in my wisdom and my power. So God is sovereign, God is omnipotent, He is just, He is loving, and He is perfectly righteous. So what should be our motive for uh, serving this God? God is innately worthy of our trust and worship. Just because who he is, I am who I am and that is why he worship me and it is not contingent on the benefits that he provides. So if you look at uh, what God provides and if we, uh, um, if we start to worship him, if we, if we start to serve our God only based on the goodness that God gives, then uh, that is not the way to go and uh, you are in for a rude awakening if you keep doing that. So God is innately worthy of our trust and worship. And we do sing that uh, for all your goodness, we'll keep on singing. So we sing and praise God for our goodness. We have testimonies, you know, we come and praise our God for our testimonies. That is, uh, that is great. But if we are, the motive of our worship is that goodness, then uh, it is, uh, we see that God is irrespective of our goodness, whether we are in, in um, enjoying his prosperity or in suffering, God is innately worthy of trust and worship. And I just quickly want to go through an example from the New Testament where uh, we see Jesus actually acting out uh, this. 
So actually I read this uh, this week and I thought why don't I just uh, go through this and use that as an, another example. So one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And if you look at what happened, Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So we'll uh, see that, uh, the, I mean, they had tried all night and there was no fish there and then Jesus tells him to do this and then Simon, uh, they cast their nets and then they catch fish in such large quantities that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners and the other boats to come and help them and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. So they had such a big catch, there was abundance of fish whereas there was none uh, the, the whole night when they were fishing. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. So here again, we see that uh, what made uh, Simon Peter say this? You know, he says, what was he um, astonished by? He, was see, he saw Jesus in all his majesty. If you, uh, he was struck by the sense of the power of Christ. So that power again, uh, as we, as uh, Yahweh uh, reveals himself to Job, and he talks about, describes all his power, and Peter actually witnessed this. He saw the power of Christ and the greatness of his majesty, where uh, Yahweh explained all the majesty of his creation. The, uh, Peter just saw this in front of him, and then he was conscious of his unworthiness. Just like God said to John, you are a puny little guy, and who are you to ask me this question? Similarly, uh, uh, Peter saw this, saw that uh, he, he was aware of his, he was conscious of his unworthiness to stand in the presence of Jesus. And uh, we see how uh, all it needs is to, uh, for us to follow God, is to see his majesty and uh, his power. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and, uh, and so were James and John, the son, sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. So what is the motive to um, serve God? What is, the, the, what is Simon's motive in uh, following Jesus? Was it because of the good catch of fish and said, Oh, if I keep following Jesus every day, I will get a boat full of fish. So, was he uh, looking at the benefits of following Jesus as a goodness or did he follow Jesus because he's looking at seeing his majesty and his power. And that is what uh, in, uh, the book of Job tells us. The, the motive for our worship should be uh, who God is and not the goodness that uh, he brings. So then I have to touch upon this unexplained suffering. Uh, that uh, Job went through and also when we go through times of uh, this unexplained suffering how are we going to reorient ourselves and Job did not get an answer for his suffering the reason is we are living in a fallen world and uh, it is actually operated by a rule of a fallen being and it is only a relationship with God uh, it's only by a relationship with God that this fallen humanity, uh, this fallen humanity can find uh, any sense of meaning or purpose in the, among the injustices of this world. So there is injustice in the world, there is unjust suffering, but it's only a personal relationship with God which will 
uh, give you, which uh, can uh, give you a meaning and purpose when you are within operating in this unjust world. And so, Job did not get an answer for our suffering, but we know that uh, there is going to be suffering. Christ said that he is going to suffer and Christ also said that on account of me, you will suffer. So there is going to be suffering and uh, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for him. So any suffering that comes, which is unexplained, uh, we know that uh, God knows. We know that here Job did not know why he was suffering, but God knew that it was um, you know, an arrangement between him and Satan there. God knew uh, from, the, from the beginning, from the outset, that Job is blameless and upright. And he let Satan do that to, uh, so that Satan could, uh, you know, to show that Job is not going to curse God, come what may. And similarly, we have to stand firm in our, in, uh, in our unjust suffering. And um, again, Paul to the Philippians writes, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in the sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And this, uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. So, we are sharers in Christ's sufferings and uh, so it is not, um, there's not going to be prosperity every time, there are going to be times when we suffer, but we, we know that we have a mighty God, we have a God in His majesty, we put our trust in His wisdom and in His power and this God and that's all we need. So whether in prosperity or suffering, we have to treasure our relationship with God and trust in His wisdom and power. Now I found something. Uh, from in the book of Job, which also gives you how to endure suffering. Now this made me uh, wonder because this is actually, um, we say um, the book of Job is a wisdom book. Now it's also prophetic in the sense, look at this, it says, uh, in Job chapter 19, it says, I know my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. So Job, uh, and at that time, the mystery hidden in Christ was not revealed. Job uh, makes a statement, there's a statement there in the book of Job, chapter 19, where Job is having his discourse. And we can see that Christ suffered for us to take our sins away, and uh, he cleanses up us with his blood. And he is seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us. And he is our Redeemer, who has reconciled us to God. And with this firm belief and hope, we can uh, reorient ourselves knowing that in all the hardships, we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. And uh, the next verse also says, after, And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Again, prophetic, uh, what was to come. And um, we have this great hope uh, because we know that Jesus died and rose again. And so we know that when the Lord comes down from heaven in all his splendor, those dead in Christ will rise first and th those still alive will follow. And this is what uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians um, says. So we have this great hope and uh, we can endure our suffering because God has given us this hope. And Meanwhile, we are going to rejoice in the assurance of meeting the Lord and be with the Lord forever. So, uh, if, you, uh, if we stand firm, and Paul says, when you think you are uh, standing firm, stand firm, so that you don't put your hope in anything. Now, Satan wanted Job to curse God, and then what the next option would have been to look elsewhere for any kind of healing or any kind of answer to his problem. But Job stood with God, and one thing commendable was that even though Job cursed himself, he said he cursed the day of his birth, he even uh, started to question God about his injustice, but all along he longed for God's presence and uh, he wanted to be restored to those days when God preserved his life. So we see that Job had that relationship with God and uh, so uh, he did not uh, lose his hope, even though in that hopeless state where he, he suffered, uh, he was reduced to nothing, he did not curse God. And we live in, a, in awe of our everlasting God, praising and worshipping Him. 
Uh, and that's what we can do because, again, in all His Majesty, and that's what we do here uh, when we come for uh, worship. We praise Him, uh, we worship Him in His uh, all His Majesty, and at the same time we encourage each other in our uh, in, in our sufferings, and also we pr we pray for one another. And this is what we do. But God, but uh, the Book of Job teaches us. Uh, one of the aspects it teaches us is that our motive for worshiping God must be because who He is, the great God He is, and has nothing to do with the benefits that we receive. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, I think Jason has covered something that is that is very important. Uh, because at the end of it, the only thing that God really judges is motive, right? Actions are not as important as what God, God looks at the heart. And if we claim to have a relationship with Him, when we, when in any of our relationships, there are times when the people who we love uh, do not necessarily behave in a way that makes us happy, right? Whether it's your children or your wife or your brother or your sister, it is there is. But that relationship is built on love because we know who that person is. We love that person for who he is, not necessarily the way he behaves in that particular, he or she behaves in that way. And this is something that we need to keep in our hearts, in our relationship with God as well, that we have an almighty God who we serve. And even when we don't understand, we believe that his God, that, that his, his love is unchanging and that he is just a good God. Can we pray? Lord, we want to thank you for this time. We thank you for the word that we have heard, Lord. And we pray that it will draw us closer to you to help us to understand more of who you are, even though we know that you are beyond our comprehension. And uh, this afternoon, Lord, as we gather together for, for the food, we ask that you will bless it, that it be strength to us. And we ask that as we leave from here, we will hold in our hearts uh, a little more understanding and knowledge about your goodness, your mercy, your faithfulness, and your amazing love for us, Lord. We thank you and praise you for these things in Jesus' name.